and my name is Wayne Kimmel, managing partner of 76 Capital and a proud board member of Startup Health. Now, I've been involved with Startup Health from the beginning. When Steve Krein and Unity Stokes came up with this idea to transform healthcare, to do something that no one else has ever done, to go out and activate an army of transformers to do things that everyone else thinks would be impossible. It's all about the right kinds of people, all of you out here, and it's all about the team at Startup Health. And that's what we're all about at 76 Capital. We're, it's really simple what we do. We work with smart and nice people who want to change the world. Well, let me tell you something. Steve Krein, Unity Stokes, and the team at Startup Health, that's what they're all about. They're smart, obviously. They're nice. They're the kind of people you want to work with. And man, are they going to change the world. But how are they going to do that? They're doing that because of all of you. And that's something that is absolutely incredible. And every single time I come back here to San Francisco for this conference and I see the growth, what's happened here, the festival now, we're, we're busting at the seams here. We gotta go somewhere else next year, right? Or, or maybe they'll make this place bigger, who knows? But it's so incredible to see over the years how we've grown from just having what we were doing with our showcases and now where we are today with over 180 companies from 17 different countries around the world that are truly transforming healthcare. And this means the world to me and I'm thrilled to be a board member and be involved and an investor in Startup Health from the beginning. So what I'd like to do right now is invite up onto the stage Unity Stokes, the president of, of Startup Health, as well as our chairman of the board, Jerry Levin. Now, let me tell you something about, come on in guys. You know, I'm, I'm, before I give the mic up. Um, He's not gonna give it up. Uh -oh. <laughs> Jerry knows that I, I would stand here and talk with you about all sorts of things. I'll tell you about my book, no, I'm kidding. Um, whatever, you want, whatever you want to hear about. Uh, but the thing is, it really is an honor to introduce these, these two gentlemen. And I'll tell you, you know, over the years, getting to know Unity and how talented he is. I mean, look at the brand of this, of Startup Health. It's his brainchild. It, this, this brand, how this, how this all looks, he runs this company extremely well. And he and his partner, Steve Krein, do a hell of a job. And Jerry, what more can we say? I mean, when Jerry joined us and joined us on the board at Startup Health and became an investor with all these other incredible investors that we have, it's Jerry. I mean, we, at, you know, Jerry reunited, he was reunited with Steve Case on, on, at one of our Startup Health events. We've got investors like Mark Cuban and others who were involved with us here, and it's just great to have Jerry, and my God, the kind of knowledge and things that you can learn as a health transformer from just the things that Jerry's done over the years is incredible. And the things that he's, you've taught me, and we've, it, it really means a lot to me, and the, the, the stories and his passion, and his passion for change, and his passion for innovators, and his passion for just doing something that other people think is impossible. He's done that a number of times. And what we're doing right now is a lot of things that we're all trying to do are impossible but will not be impossible because we're going to all make it happen. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Unity and hope you guys have a great conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wayne. Um, and Jerry, uh, what an honor to be with you here um, and always. Um, so I thought we'd start the conversation. I've always wanted to be on stage with Unity Stokes. He's a moderator extraordinaire. Everything is unrehearsed. Go for it. There we go. Um, so I thought we'd start the, the conversation with a question you actually asked me on stage many years ago. I think we were at South by Southwest, and I didn't know how to respond. So I thought I'd, I'd flip it back to you and, and hopefully be able to reflect on, on your answer. But who are you, and why are you here? Can you tell me how you answered that? I, 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 I'm still trying to figure out an answer. You know, it's, uh, they're obviously the two most fundamental questions that you can spend your whole life on and not even address. 
but I think it's fairly simple. Uh, I'm a small town kid from the suburbs of Philadelphia who somehow wanted to have an impact on the world. I didn't know what it was or what it would turn out to be. Uh, but I think if I had to express it in one word, it would be about values, human values. You know, trying to make a difference in the lives of people in ways that uh, I couldn't have foreseen. So, uh, I'm not a value creator. I'm, I have the, the aspiration to exercise those values. And what's so exciting to me these past two days is to see the, the connection that everybody who's here has a value system that I truly admire. So I feel very comfortable. This is a third act for me and something that I am passionate about. So, you know, you've, you've been coming to JP Morgan with us for years. You've been with Startup Help from the beginning. How do you describe what's going on? Um, you know, the last few days, but also sort of the transformation you've seen uh, over the last few years of how things are evolving and where we are today. There, there is clearly something in the air. If you don't feel the energy of the last two days, uh, you know, we have word forms to describe the nurturing and support of an army of transformational health activists. But, let, let, you know, I've been thinking about it as I've been sitting and, and ingesting the energy. Uh, it's a little hard to articulate, but what I'm sensing is the word army, words are very important. And obviously it has a lot to do with a common mission where everybody's working together. I think that's extremely important. I grew up in a business environment that was masculine oriented, all about competition. And I can give you the litany of names that I've competed against. But this is a new way of operating a business. It's about collaboration. It's about connection. It's about striving with the same goal. Very unusual in the highly competitive business of yesterday. I would have to say it's almost an adoption of the feminine principle, not the masculine principle, of engagement, cooperation, collaboration. Uh, the phrase, let's change the world, is used uh, probably too often today. But here, and you can feel it the last two days, there's real meaning to that. There's real meaning in joining together to make something happen. The other thing I would say is, uh, it goes back to who am I. As you listen to everyone on the, every panel, so it's not only the phenomenal entrepreneurs in these various rooms, but everyone in leadership who spoke was expressing a value system. And those values had a lot to do with, uh, we're all blessed with the gift of life. How do you make people healthy, you know, whether they live in Aleppo or San Francisco? How do you make them have a fulfilling, happy life. I would venture to say that no matter what the business construct of everyone who's spoken here, that they would agree that that's their fundamental value system. We live at a time when the environment, at least the political environment here, is actually hostile to that. So it's even more important for these values to be expressed, implemented, and with everyone joining together. It's a very, you know, I think we were hardwired for connection anyhow, 
and this is a manifestation of that. And what, within the context of business and creating successful companies and startups building the, the future, why do values matter so much? Well, values matter because uh, if your intention is totally financially driven, and if you're a public company driven by Wall Street, or driven by a fast exit, or the fastest path to liquidity, then uh, you've lived uh, half of a life. You haven't lived a full life. The notion that a company, including a startup, should operate for the interest of whoever the shareholders happen to be, but of co-equal importance, to operate in the public interest, that company is going to have more impact, probably be more financially successful, because there's passion underneath it. It's not a job. It's a life's aspiration. So uh, the question of leadership, which each company needs in starting, in scaling up, in transforming the company, what we would call values-based leadership, that the person who's developed the business strategy has a set of values that are articulated that drive the organization in ways that if it's just a simplistic mission statement with not a lot of conviction, then you have a hollow corporation. Mm -hmm. So do your values emerge or how do they emerge and how do well, you discover them? It's, it's interesting because when you reach my age, uh, a lot of things get triggered early on. And I happen to have uh, dinner last night with my college roommate. and We've known each other for 60 years. And we were sharing, obviously, war stories. But it's very clear that uh, our values were formed at that time. And it's such a privilege to express them. And if you look around today for values-based leadership, just to continue on that theme, where is it coming from? And that's why I think it's exciting what we're all doing, because it's not coming from political leadership. It's not necessarily coming from academic leadership. It's not coming enough from corporate leadership or the nonprofit world that there's an opportunity, I think, for the leaders who are invested in transforming what we're calling healthcare, which is really about the pursuit of happiness on a global basis for everybody, and to pursue it with unbelievable dreams like no cost access to healthcare for every person on the planet. If whoever's involved in that would kind of speak out publicly about issues, because as we heard from the panel this morning, everything that happens in a community affects what we're calling healthcare. So your strategy on infrastructure or economic development are all a part of the fabric of the pursuit of a fulfilling life. So this is kind of a plea that I think in this, the largest, I believe the largest GDP sector, but the one that has the most promise for our planet's future, should use the bully pulpit of leadership to talk about these values. And uh, I feel that's true of Unity and Steve and Howard, that we're privileged to be on the cusp of this disruptive revolution, but it's not 
disruption in the sense of taking something down. It's disruption in the sense of building a values construct to give people the chance that they should have when they come through that birth canal. So I want to go back to a word you mentioned and, and we talk about, which is army. Um, and our stated goal of really supporting and organizing a global army of, of health transformers so we can pursue health and happiness and, and hopefully improve the health and well-being of billions of people around the world. Um, I'll never forget being uh, at South by Southwest with, with you and Steve. This was years ago. I think we were cruising around in a rickshaw somewhere and, and really Startup Health was a dream on a napkin at that point. We were developing it. This was many years ago. And one of the things we were talking about is this idea of organizing a, a global community, what we now call our army of, of health transformers. And, and one of the challenges we've always had is defining what Startup Health is. And so I'd be curious um, to sort of dig into that a little of, of how you describe startup health and, and why this army of health transformers really within the context of them matters. The reason why I think life is about metaphors, if you're talking to someone and you have an idea, they'll immediately <clears throat> go to, well, that's like something because it's so hard to imagine somebody's talking to you and telling you something that isn't like anything you've ever heard. It's very unusual. So there's a, and even the analysis of big data is all about finding correlations, connections, metaphors, similes. It's like something. So the use of uh, words that trigger metaphors is very important. Startup health in its earliest stage, the only people could only thing that people could grasp was, is it an incubator, is it an accelerator, there's an academy, but that doesn't, it's a totally woeful metaphor because the use of the word army of healthcare transformers is designed to say that there is a mission that everyone is going to cooperate in the execution of that mission and that you were going to wage battle against a force that needs to be denied. It's a very powerful form of expression. And what's interesting about Startup Health, it's one of the few cases I can think of where there isn't an analog or a metaphor because no one is doing what Startup Health is doing. Yes, there are festivals, there's a J.P. Morgan conference, but it doesn't have the energy or the simplicity of goals uh, that the Startup Health Festival has. And by the way, I should say, we wanted to thank Wayne for introducing us. We love being in Wayne's world. <laughs> He's he has a book you should ask him about because Startup Health is really about networking. And Wayne has produced a book that's kind of a model of networking. But networking is not just a passing connection of business cards. Networking is coming together with like-minded souls on a com combined mission. So that's really what Startup Health does. So this is more than an event, uh, a, a festival, a convention, a conference. It's an aggregation of souls who have values, who are feeling similar energy. And when you sit down to talk at one of the tables, it's not about a transaction. It's about joining together and, and seeing something in someone, hearing their story which is the last thing I'd say about Startup Health. I was in the storytelling business most of my life. The thing that is so fascinating is everybody has a story. And instead of sitting down just to make a deal, if you start out with 
just tell me about, as you ask me, who you are, get to the story. You're going to find something in the family background that's absolutely not only fascinating, but enables you to engage with that person and give them not only respect, but everybody wants to be seen, heard, and understood. You know, I'll make a public confession. When I was, I could say it was a great job, a CEO of a company with 90,000 people. If I ran into one of you and we shook hands, I'd find out in 30 seconds whether who, what you do and whether what you do has anything to do with one of the businesses of Time Warner. If I didn't pick that up in the first 30 seconds, I would find probably not even a graceful way of moving on. The me today will meet somebody and I don't really care about the business card or what the current assignment is. I care deeply about who that person is, where they're going, what's influencing them, what's the stories and I know I said that was the last thing, that was the penultimate yeah. thing. So your own stories that you carry around with you are not necessarily true. It's not that you embellish, but these are the stories that you carry from childhood that determine the way you're going to nurture, the way you're going to exist in the world. And over time, they're either constructive motivating stories or we have to do something about the negative stories. It's not that they're true, it's that they govern your psychology and the way you conduct yourself. It's a very interesting way of looking at people. And if we looked at healthcare as driving an individual and a family and a community's well-being, what's their story, how can we enhance it and embrace it instead of the current ancient system of delivering health care, we would have a holistic and I think much more successful system. So we have a, a room full of health transformers, um, not only here but around the world as well, a big room. Um, how can we make more progress together? Well, uh, you know, it always helps to be impatient and it's the, this slight tension, and we felt in some of the panels, between what we would call incremental change and massive transformation. And I guess I would give us the same advice that I think we're executing on. And that is to have these transformational goals appear to be impossible. I think that's what people need to really drive home, you know, whether it's we're going to do in 25 years, we're going to do it in five years or 10 years, is really to have that, that goal, that mission. You know, having been a student of and an implementer of corporate mission statements, which didn't do a damn thing to enlighten the company, the, these, we're calling them moonshots. I call them aspirational trajectories. That I, it forces you, it, it's like the Declaration of Independence, it forces you on, to think about the ultimate goal of life on the planet. And if it's, it sounds broad scale, but that's a driver, and I would continue to re reinforce that. The other thing I would say is that we have 10 categories trying to mirror the, the needs that are out there. But as long as that's a living document, I think that would be helpful. Mm. So we are going to open it up to questions. So if anyone has a um, question, just raise your hand. We've got a couple of mic runners here. Um, while 
people are, are, are thinking of their questions. I do have one um, I wanted to ask you related to the 10 health moonshots. Um, and I know one of these 10 is of particular importance. Um, you talk frequently about the connection and importance of mind, body, and spirit to health and, and well-being. Um, I thought maybe share why, why you feel that's so important. The uh, mind, body, and spirit, of course, is a cliche now. It's a quinoa, kale cliche. Uh, what I think is fascinating, we know very little about the brain and the central nervous system. But in fact, uh, we have inside of us, the brain has an apothecary. The central nervous system has morality. And what happens is, if your intentionality is positive, that what I'm about to do or experience is going to help me, your system understands that and sends those endorphins to reinforce it. And in fact, uh, I believe that the relationship of storytelling to experience that the delivery of body, mind, spirit, and healthcare itself is theatrical. There's a theater of medicine. There's a kind of presentation. There gets to be a ritual that I feel comfortable with. So I'm going in not for a treatment, but for an experience. In ancient times, the healers or the shamans would have a lot of ceremonies stories were told orally so there's some connection i'm not articulating this very well but I, I i feel it that when you enter whether it's a operating room or a therapist's office or an aa meeting that the experience itself if it's something you believe in that will reinforce the efficacy of the experience. And there's actually a lot of data to support that. Uh, I happen to have Parkinson's. Uh, I've tried <coughs> running a little virtual center to help people with Parkinson's because neurologists who are wonderful people don't have Parkinson's. So I'll go into somebody's home who has Parkinson's and just talk to them. I'm not a therapist, but I have it. Uh, and I'll talk to the family and try and help, usually with some ther therapies that are psychological. Because I believe so strongly in this positive intentionality. And when I failed, I failed because I went into a home and the person who has the diagnosis, which is subjective anyhow, says, I've tried everything, nothing's going to work, anything you can say isn't going to help me, then nothing's going to work. And there was nothing I could do to help. So, I mean, I'm espousing a philosophy, but there is scientific data that the immune system, and the central nervous system, and the operation of the brain the plasticity of the brain actually can be altered. I've trained my, I don't walk very well, but I've retrained myself to walk, and I'm happy. That has to help my diagnosis. Absolutely. Um, questions, yes. Hi, Jerry. Um, I was curious to know, when did you- Say your name. Oh. Yeah, I'm Daniel from Shift Health. Um, I was curious to know about the transition between having no time for people to having time to learn about who the people were and what catalyzed that um, and kind of what time, time in your career were you uh, when that happened? Well, uh, you know, we're fortunate in life if we can find, uh, if we can make radical changes in our belief system and in our the way we conduct ourselves. 
Uh, mine came in part through uh, personal tragedy, uh, but also uh, what I saw in the corporate world. Uh, I lost a son, which I never recovered from. And then when 9-11 occurred, uh, it rekindled for me and for our family this loss that comes so unexpectedly when you think you have everything. And when I tried to use the instrument of uh, the corporate resources I had at my disposal to help survivors and families, um, I gave every part of Time Warner as much money as you want to spend to help these people. So I was at a, uh, two things happened. One, I was CEO of the company, but we had a board meeting scheduled, and we had just gone down because with journalists to see 9-11, two days after the event. And we had a board meeting scheduled for the next day, and I couldn't believe we, we shouldn't have a board meeting out of respect. The board insisted that was one part of something that really did not resonate well with me. The other was I was making a Wall Street presentation, and I said we've given it every possible resource to every part of our company to help people. Somebody got up and raised his hand. If it were her, we wouldn't have had this question. And he said, isn't that going to affect your margins? Can you tell us what that's going to do when you put your quarterly earnings out? And I just, that was it. I got up, I was already standing. I walked out and never returned and left the company a month or two later. That why didn't, shouldn't I have realized early on that the way particularly larger corporations were being run did not have heart, did not take into account holistic humanity. I should have seen it, but I didn't, and it took those events. And I knew I had to go on a spiritual journey, and fortunately I met my wife and she's taken me there. More questions? Hi, Rashida Bob. I um, actually was a Time Week employee once um, with my own consultancy, RZB Consultant and um, Peppermint Venture Fund. My question Sorry, for... Can you talk a little louder? Sure. My name is Rashida Bob. I actually worked at Time Inc. once. Um, I have my own consultancy, RZB Consultant, and also work at Peppermint Venture Funds. And my question to you is, can you speak as an executive and very seasoned person about hiring different people, um, hiring people in diverse ideas and diverse backgrounds? It's a topic that comes up a lot in all industries around technology and startups. And um, can you just speak to that, of what you've learned in your life about hiring and surrounding yourself with people with diverse ideas? advantages and disadvantages of that. Can you repeat it? Yeah, I wanted to speak end. to um, the I Oh, you can't hear me. Wow, it sounds so loud. Excuse me, guys. Um, any, uh, any insights on hiring smart people, diverse people, diverse set of ideas and backgrounds? Your insights as an executive. Hiring diverse... Did you say hiring? Hiring diverse people, hiring diverse people with diverse backgrounds, different, different backgrounds, different ideas and the importance okay. of them. <laughs> Well, uh, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, Hold it up. I mean, it's truly a critical question. Thank you. Um, particularly in this world we're currently living in. Uh, the, the first thing is, it's pretty clear that uh, we're adjacent to Silicon Valley has been built by an immigrant population. Uh, that not only do black lives matter, everybody's life matters. And it's, it's time for uh, our male, white-oriented 
institutions to wake up and ingest this diversity that is the strength of America. American exceptionalism has come because of the e pluribus unum, the diversity made into a new oneness, a new unity. You have to bless Unity's parents for giving him that name. Thanks, Bob. And I think today, more than ever, we have a political environment, a lack of values-based leadership that's permitting a form of discrimination that unfortunately I haven't seen in quite some time. But to turn it around, the opportunities, particularly in healthcare, where we're all the same, we're, we're all unique, but we're all the same. We're all connected in many different ways. So it's, it's time for corporations to be feminine oriented, to be black oriented, to be sexually embracing any ethnicity that you can think of that's where the strength is and people come to America in order to be part of that community and so we have the opportunity in a startup environment to build that into the infrastructure Hi, Teddy Hodges. I'm a health transformer creator of Brace Under. I'm curious to hear when you started your spiritual approach or the actions and how you incorporated that into your business model or business actions. And if you could give yourself advice when you were younger to incorporate those spiritual ideas, what type of advice would you give yourself? I'm, I'm not sure I heard the question completely, so let me ramble on. <laughs> Uh, uh, I was very idealistic when I was uh, in college and in the 60s. You know, the phrase uh, power corrupts is probably accurate. Uh, what happens uh, if you happen to ascend a hierarchical corporate ladder and reach the top, you get a phenomenon which I vowed I would not succumb to, but I didn't keep that vow, papal infallibility and absolute power. Because the way corporations are constructed, instead of being managed intelligently by a board representing shareholders, it pretty much is up to the CEO to do whatever he or she wants. And I think what happened to me was, although I strive mightily against it, you just, the perquisites of that position, I mean, look at what we pay CEOs in any event. I think the advice I would give is whatever your value system, your idealism is now coming out of college, which is a golden period, and uh, post whatever graduate school, if any, those values are probably the values you're going to carry. And don't let them get disturbed when you have to scale a business or personal tragedy hits or things aren't working out the way they're supposed to. Just hold on to those values and be authentic, be open, but always resort to the morality, the intrinsic morality that's in your soul. So we have time for one more question. We'll do two. Hi, uh, Jane Metcalf, Neolife Media. 
As a media person, I'm curious what you think the possibilities are for the media to impact health today. What's the biggest opportunity a media company has for impacting health? What's the biggest opportunity um, for media to impact health today? Oh, well, it's not only the 80 hours of video that will come out of this festival for Startup Health. Uh, obviously, video still rules the world. It, it always will, whether it's high def or virtual reality. Um, and the ability to deliver not only information, but experiences that relate to all the new findings that are coming with the development of healthcare. There's a tremendous opportunity to use storytelling to enlighten and engage people. Because ultimately, this is a revolution about individuals and families taking control of their health. And so the most impactful form of information and story transmission happens to be video. And we have certain categories from movies, television, and documentaries, but those categories will go by the wayside. And we're seeing that happen already. But video is a powerful medium, and Startup Health is gonna be a player. Thank you, Joe, for your insights. I'm Sebastian Roberts, I'm a doctor from the UK, uh, representing Clinicia. Try to talk louder. Sorry, talk louder. Um, closer, closer, sorry. My question relates to the moonshots. So I've come here from London and to learn about these, uh, obviously as individuals to carry out and to achieve these moonshots. I'm just interested in your insights across your entire career, what particular behavioral and personal um, traits you see as important in actually engaging the, the conveyance and actually the achievements uh, which are required to deliver those moonshots as individuals. As individuals, I'm sort of paraphrasing here, um, what's needed, what achievements are required to accomplish these extraordinary big, bold moonshots? I was going to ask you how the weather was in London, but I don't know. You know, I, I think it's the definition of an entrepreneur. Now, there are many different versions of entrepreneurs. You know, I happen to grow up with Ted Turner, for example. It's, it's the ability to see something out here. You know, we call them moonshots now, but this has always been the case, from Edison to Tesla. You see, you see it out here not very many people see it. And no matter who gets in your way or what you're being told, you're gonna drive to that. You're gonna drive everybody a little crazy, but you're gonna drive to that goal. And nothing is, nothing is gonna stop you. Not failure, not lack of funds. You're just totally committed. Now, you have to learn along the way, and you have to adjust along the way. But it's that driving passion. And you can tell, I mean, it's what Steve and Unity call the, there is a mindset that people have, that investors have, and they're all on the same page, which is they believe in it. You know, whether Moonshot is the right characterization it at least is a metaphor for something that if you set the goal as Jack Kennedy did and said we're going to be on the moon by the end of this decade we were on the moon by the end of this decade I think that's the metaphor that really is very striking well Jerry thank you uh, thank you so much for your leadership thank you for everything you've done to help start up health and, and the health care help transform our community. And thank you for being such a wonderful friend and uh, Startup Health personal Yoda, I like to, to call you. Um, thank you, so and Unity is a father of little Coco. We should salute him. Yes.
two weeks old.